Welcome to this podcast, Holistic Creators, where we share our unique and universal stories about shaping the future for the four Ps, people, planet, purpose, and profit. My name is Manet Kunze. I'm a mental coach and your host of this show. My intention for this show is to inspire you on your path to a holistic future. So welcome. Hello and welcome to my podcast, Holistic Creators. My name is Vanette and I'm your host. Today, my guest is Kelly Lynn Adams. She is an award-winning certified executive leadership and life coach, international speaker, creator of the Perfection Imperfection podcast, listening to globally. She is also the founder of the Women's Work Worth movement, which has helped thousands of high-achieving leaders manage their mindset, maximize their time, and monetize in their business. Kelly Lynn has spent over 18 years in corporate America working for some of the top retail and fashion brands in the world, like Gucci, DKNY Jeans, Candice and Cole, and Bed Bath, and beyond, just to name a few. She works with individuals through one-on-one -on -one private coaching in two of her signature group programs, Shatter Your Own Glass Ceiling and Unstoppable, and speaks for brands, organizations, and teams globally. Her mission is to lead with love, call out your blind spots, and help you get out of your own way. Elevate and expand by creating transformation, impact, and influence through mindset and embodiment training, managing stress and mastering inner freedom and peace. She helps people to re redefine success through shifting and reprogramming their thoughts, increasing their confidence, stepping into their power, and supersizing their self-love. She is trained in and uses different modalities and methodologies within her coaching like neuroscience, NLP, emotional intelligence, somatic release techniques, cognitive behavior therapy techniques, trauma release techniques, and practices, and practices, practices confident management, parts and therapy and techniques, breathwork, facilitation techniques, sexual embodiment, masculine and feminine energies, embodied co cognition, and spiritual wisdom. So thank you so much for being here. And this is just amazing to hear what you're trained in and what your background is. So welcome to my show. Oh my gosh, Lana, thank you so much. And that, that, thank you so much for reading that bio. I'm like, wow, I need to really shorten that bio. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, I'm pretty. <laughs> yeah, but, so thank you, thank but you so this much. is you, this is you. So <laughs> yeah. So um, for me, uh, it would be interesting to understand what is the connection about being uh, or coming from a, a history or a journey from being in, in the fashion society and then shifting to become a coach. So let us know a little bit about your background and all how this happened. I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. You know, so when I was younger, um, I was very shy, actually, and um, got over a speech impediment and had a couple of like learning disabilities. And but I always was drawn to New York City uh, and I always was drawn to building my own business, but always also drawn to the fashion industry. So, you know, I climbed the corporate ladder in the fashion. I always loved fashion. I wasn't a designer though. I was like, the, I was the other side, right? The finances and all that. And what I always, I think the through line was I always loved studying people. Like I could sit in a park and watch people for hours. And so that was always the common thread to it. And then really how I climbed the corporate ladder, it was like studying people. It was studying the executives. It was studying, you know, and so how I got into coaching, I'll, I'll tell you that in a little bit, but for me, I had a lot of traumas in life. And so I was, you know, really working so hard uh, because that was like my thought pattern at that time was if I worked so hard, that's going to bring me the love and the worthiness and all that because I got recognition, right? The harder I worked, the more I did, uh, the more appreciation, the more love, the recognition, all of that came. And so when I was in the, the retail and the fashion industry, um, I started a network marketing business on the side. And one of my clients was like, you be a great coach. And this is back in like 2009 when like coaching really wasn't sexy, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, there's executive coaches and everything, but it really wasn't talked about, right? It wasn't really as popular as it is today. And so I went back, got certification And I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Like, this is the study of people, the study of self, the, and all the different techniques that go along with it. And then that's how I started coaching. And, you know, I built my business for years, like 
with co corporate, you know, on the side. And, uh, and that's, I've got, I've coached thousands, you know, and I really love all the modalities. Uh, but, but for me, it was more of the self-discovery piece, you know, and still is today uh, because I can't take my clients where I haven't gone. And, and that's, that's my thought process now anyway. So, so yeah, that's a little bit of, in a nutshell of my background and, and all of that. Yeah, what I also see is that often, like, um, the self-expression is visible uh, in the clothes you wear and uh, also how you think about yourself or how you think you have to behave in a certain kind of environment. And if I look back, for example, into my life, I had different kind of, of styles, uh, yeah, kind of uh, certain kind of periods of styles. And, uh, for example, I was a business consultant and coach uh, when I left Germany uh, many years ago. And this was kind of wearing the black suit and the high heels and you know, the typical wearing this kind of clothes. And when I left Germany, I felt like, no, this is not me anymore. So I, I sold everything, gave everything away to charities and then became more like uh, this boho style and like more spiritual and, and like long skirts and everything like that. And this was also a period. And now I see that all these different elements come together and I'm in this process of re redefining who what do I want to be and how do I express myself. And I think this is also the process understanding who how who are you how how do, do you feel about yourself and how do you express yourself in for example clothes yeah and i love that and, and i think that's so prevalent just in life in general right it doesn't matter what season what age there is this this thing of reinvention of yourself and i love that you said that because I feel like every year I also reinvent myself, right? Because we're not the same. We're, we're growing, right? If you're not growing, you're dying and we're, we're all growing. And so I love that you brought that up because for me, my journey really has been this whole reinvention, right? Of like being more expressed and uh, really, you know, shattering your own glass ceilings. And that can take a definition of itself, right? Financially, you know, expressive wise, inner and outer work. And Reinvention for me is required. It's required for growth and you can have fun with it. You can learn from it. And I think a lot of people, I think the collective too, at a certain point is also like reinventing themselves, right? The thought patterns, the subconscious, right? Like how we look at things. So I love that you said like the reinvention because also, and, and you know this, like the inner work is also, it gets expressed outward. So sometimes when people's appearances change, it's because they went through a reinvention of themselves. So I love that you brought that up because I think that's such a great topic of just the work that is done, you know, with people. And, and just as we grow, it's like, who do you want to be? How do you want to show up in the world? And that's the fun part. Hmm. Also very interesting. And I think these are topics that a lot of my people who are now listening can relate to is this, the more I work, the more uh, I get uh, attention uh, and the more I feel loved. Like these kind of belief they have about themselves, like I'm not good enough or I will never make it or I'm too whatever, tall, too small, too old to, to do this kind of job. And then like overacting, uh, being more than perfect to uh, become visible, to become recognized, as you said, and then have this feeling, okay, these people do love me, but for sure this is not the, the case, but it's recognition, but it's not true love. What do you hear? What are these kind of beliefs people um, do have about themselves that make behave like you did? Yeah, and, and listen, there's still there's still areas in my life that I still do. I, I catch myself. I'm like, Kelly, what are you doing? Right. And cause we're human, I'm human. Um, and it is, it's, it's the external validation, right? The seeking of the attention, the love, the adoration, right? The appreciation. And we crave that as humans, right? So, however, I was putting so much of myself in I have to be X, Y, or Z in order to get that love when innately. And what I'm learning is like, we are love just by being born, right? We are pure love. 
Um, and what I was doing is because it was reinforced, oh, you did a great job. You got recognition, right? Oh, you worked long hours. That was like amazing. You got it done. And it's still, right? This is still prevalent in society today. And so when we look at that and for myself, I was starving, you know, for love, for that appreciation, for, you know, I didn't really get it from uh, growing up from my family. And so I was, I was craving that, you know, it was, it was and so, and what I've learned is like, it comes from yourself, you know, in the internal, the internal game. So, you know, I hear just from a lot of people that I work with and, and just, you know, it, it is the common, it, it can go from, I don't want to speak up in a meeting or give a presentation because I'm afraid of saying something wrong. Or I, I have to work, I have to work these long hours because if I don't, who does, right? Or they're seeking validation and attention. It could be through clothes. It could be through anything. And, and you see that this a lot on social media, right? Everyone's putting their best highlight reel up on social media. And which is, you know, it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's like, okay, where are we seeking the validation, the love, the self-worth and all of that? Where is that? Like, where are we seeking that? And if it's something externally and outside of ourselves, we get to look at, okay, where can I do that for myself? And it's for the past two years, I've been going in and diving into the deep reparenting of myself, right? The inner childhood work. Um, so that has been really powerful of just reparenting yourself in a way that maybe, you know, either your parents weren't there, or maybe your parents, you did have the perfect childhood because that also is, <laughs> that also can leave some scars, right? So it's just finding where, the pieces of you are craving that validation. And listen, again, it's a human need, but what are you doing in a self-sabotaging way to yourself in order to like grasp or get that? Mm -hmm. Let's jump a little bit to the Kelly being the child, <laughs> because I think that uh, this is uh, exactly the time when we uh, create this kind of beliefs because we have some experiences and make up a story around that interpreted in a certain way, have certain kind of emotions, like being uh, yeah, connected to this experience. And for that, yeah, we, we create the, the story about who we are and um, how, how do you, how did you go back like doing this inner child work, like now grown up, but really yeah, like embracing the child and the experiences you had and do this inner child work. Can you give us this kind of, of yeah. reflection? Yeah. Yeah, so my childhood, you know, I was first born, you know, type A personality, go getter, and my parents got divorced, and I was always the one to do things, you know, always got the good grades, I raised my brother, um, so in a sense, I was very independent, like, I remember, I think, I mean, like, seven or eight, and I was just, like, cooking breakfast for the family, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, I was like, wow, like, I really was the go-getter. And so part of that was like missing a childhood, right? Because I was, you know, not forced to grow up quickly, but kind of. And, and, and so that piece of me of like, and that was great because it really, that part of me, and they talk about this in IFS, internal family systems, it's a modality and like psychotherapy and everything. It's like our parts of us, that part of me was like in survival mode. And like, I have to take care of the family. I have to take care of my brother. Um, if I don't do it, no one will. Uh, so that really helped me actually climb the corporate ladder, right? It really helped me in a lot of the successes, like type A personality, go getter, like didn't rest until it was done, um, figured it all out, made a way out of no way, all of those things. And that also served me in sports, right? And performing and all the things. So that part of me, serves me it's not wrong it's not bad however you know it it's like a shoe that doesn't fit right it wasn't fitting it got to a point in my life where I'm like this is not fitting anymore and where I learned this was I was working so hard in corporate and I wound up in the hospital because I was building my business on the side I was working these executive hours you know like 7 a.m to 10 p.m or getting cars home and so at that point, I was like, wow, like I am seeking, I, I wasn't taking care of myself at all. I was it, still in that survive, survival mode. And so that really, I think, started, you know, the reparenting conversation, not right directly, 
but it was like, okay, what are, what is going on here? It's, it's like trauma. That's, that's, I, I get to look at. So that's when it really started. Like, why am I activating this way? Not that it's good or bad, but w- what is, what is it trying to teach me? And so just like with over the years, I kept peeling back the layer of the onion. I still am like looking at, okay, where is the abandonment wound or um, the rejection wound or the seeking of approval wound? Where are those wounds and where can I really reparent myself and be love myself with all of the parts and not let them lead the way, right? Not let the abandonment lead the way uh, for the intention of my actions that I'm, that I'm putting out. So it's definitely a work in progress. And I think that's where it, it comes from, right? Your childhood, I mean, our, our subconscious is, is really molded, right? Between ages of zero and seven. And some would argue, right? Even before when you're in the womb, right? You pick up, um, you know, different generational patterns and, and everything. So it's a deeper conversation, but I mean, that's really what, what it is. We're, we're being programmed whether we like it or not from our caretakers or society or maybe something, you know, trauma is really just too much, too fast, too soon. So you could experience trauma in a car accident, right? I I remember I was in a car accident when I was younger and I still remember that. I'm like, wow. I was like, I didn't know where I was. And so, so our, our bodies also, right. Take on that trauma. So within the reparenting of myself, it was also like somatic stuff of like, okay, the body keeps score and, and really like, how can I regulate my nervous system? How can I, you know, get it out of my body, whether it's primal screams or, or anger releases, you know, of hitting pillows. So the work, you know, for me, because I was so type A and I was in my head, I was very uh, left brain, very logical. I started to get more and more in my body within the reparenting of myself. Uh, so that's kind of been a journey, but it, it's really just taking a deeper look at, okay, what is being activated here? And is it, is it to my benefit? You know, cause, cause right now, I mean, that's still like type A, that go-getter, I can switch it on in any moment. Right. And that serves like, sometimes that's like, re- it's really good to get things done. It's really good to accomplish goals. And then sometimes it's not right. So it's, there's nothing good or bad. It's just the parts of yourself and, and seeing where are they taking over and self-sabotaging you um, or where, where can they benefit you? Where can you leverage that? So, hmm. I think sometimes people can see pattern like it's, it's visible that they are in kind of a loop or that uh, special situations uh, um, happening again and again. So this is kind of visible on the outside. But how can they get clarity about what is behind? Like what is a trauma or what is, is a blocking belief or what is uh, also like um, the um, somatic uh, memory, for example? Mm -hmm. So I will say this, you know, it's just getting curious, right? Because I don't know if you've ever been in, I call them like the negative loop patterns. Like if the same thing you keep thinking over and over again, or the same lesson appears in a different way, right? So for example, you know, if let's bring up money, right? If someone is struggling with money, right? And they have been for years. Okay. Why is that? And getting curious about, okay, what's my relationship with money? What's my relationship with wealth? And even just getting curious of like, how, how did my parents, you know, activate with money? How, how, how did I see money and really getting curious of like going back, right? Or even, it doesn't have to even say going back to your childhood, but it's just getting curious of that pattern and what your beliefs are around that. And then digging in behind that, right? So, And of course, you know, hiring a a coach, a mentor, therapist, like I am so for that because yes, you can do the work for yourself and on yourself, but you get to a certain point, right? And you and I both know sometimes that third party and, and, you know, really that expert and it's, you know, no one's a guru. You're the own guru of yourself, but there's certain people that can help you right with this, with the uncovering of this, with the asking certain questions that maybe you didn't think about. So I hired a lot of help. I still do. And, and for me though, it was the willingness to get curious about it. Cause it's not easy. It's not, it's uncomfortable to look at that, you know, to really get honest and being like, okay, if it was a money thing, like getting curious and it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel good sometimes. Right. Or, or being like, okay, why do I overwork and why do I keep burning out? 
what is underneath that? So sometimes it's uncomfortable to see and to witness. And that's why people don't, you know, look at it because it's like, oh, why would I want to feel uncomfortable? Right. I want to feel comfortable and safe. And all. however, it's like we got to get to the core of what is really creating that unsafety within yourself to a degree. So, you know, and everyone's seeking either like safety and security, approval or control, right? Like we're all activating in, in those three buckets. It's a human condition. So it's like, okay, what are you seeking? Do you really want to be in control? Do you want the approval or is it the safety and security running the show? So it's just getting curious around that. I think that's like the first step for people. And I would say the second step is like getting help um, and support because again, if you were talking to me, like type A personality, I got this. I don't need any, like, and even asking for help was so difficult for me. Um, asking for help and then receiving it. So that's, and that's what I also see in a lot of the women that I work with is like, they don't ask, right? Or they're not, or they're not asking enough and they're also not receiving and they feel like, oh, if I receive something, I have to give back, right? It's, it's like a, can you receive with, without the re, re, reciprocation of it, right? So can you just receive just to receive? Hmm. I think um, showing up vulnerable is also a topic like, no, if you start asking, then you show that you are not in control or you feel perhaps that you are not in control of your life. And yeah, um, I think some, there are always moments where you can suppress what is going on, but uh, the universe is delivering the same uh, kind of, of learning process again and again and again uh, until you really step into that. So um, I can see this, for example, from my own um, history, like... Um, my um, in my genetic line my grandmother has been in two world wars my father has been in one world war and therefore they created wealth and lost everything they created again wealth and lost everything so for them it was like we can't hold our wealth and um, the world is not safe and of course this has been their experiences and definitely um, uh, this is is true for them but uh, for me, it was, I was always picking up that my grandmother, for example, cooked, uh, she had a huge garden and uh, with veggies and fruits and whatever you have. And there was always a season that she was cooking um, these uh, pickles for winter time and for time that you don't have food. So I, I, every time I visited her, I heard about like, yeah, during the war, we didn't have any food and we lost everything. And her, her basement was full with food when she died. I don't know. Food for 20 years. Yeah. A massive freezer where you can put in a, a pig. So really massive. And for her, this was like, okay, the world is not safe. We can lose everything. At least we have some food and we have clothes and the, the basic stuff. And my father, of course, had the same pattern. And for me, it is like, yeah, my fridge is never empty. But I'm aware of this pattern. And of course, I cleared it out also with help of some other coaches and, and healers. But I, I think the it is important not only to see what is in your own present life, but also understanding what comes from the ancestral line, what is given over as a pattern and as beliefs. Do you see something as uh, something like that also in your uh, life? Yeah, 100 percent. So. The generational thing is is real, right? It, because people don't aren't aware of that. And I would say um, also it is it's it's that if people were to say, okay, like where where do you feel safety? Like where are you getting the safety? And where is the control? Because we all control at some level. Um, that is, you know, for me, I think there's a, there's a lot in my family history and and generations. Um, but similar to you, I think on my dad's side, it was it was like the the scarcity, right? Because um, my grandmother had like seven children, right? So and she was also she also burnt out because she at that point she couldn't keep up with all the <laughs> all the kids like raising all these kids. So she was you know and my grandfather was the breadwinner, so he was working. He wasn't really helpful around the house. So she had all these seven kids, right, with no help. So, so that I know is definitely a pattern, right, of my burnout of like, oh, I can do it all and really like self-sacrifice myself. So that was definitely prevalent because that's what happened to her. And then also, I think there's like a couple of addictions, right, that like, uh, like 
money and gambling addictions, alcohol addictions. I mean, I was definitely like an alcoholic in my twenties, right? So it is, it's, and it's clearing those patterns, but also being aware of like, yes, it also comes from the generation, but, and that's why I think this work is so powerful because when you start to heal yourself, you're healing yourself, but you're healing like seven generations before you. And then seven generations that come um, after you. So it's, it's so powerful because you're shifting the dynamic. So you're, yes, you're doing it for yourself, but you're just also doing it for everyone else that was involved. Um, and that will be, so you're, you're changing the energy as well. So there is definitely addictions like in my family for sure. Um, and I even see like the control and that's what also I'm working on now, right? It's, it's letting go of the control and seeking safety in the unknown. And so that's actually what I'm working on now. It's like, okay, like there's so many unknowns, right? Even with like COVID, right? When that first started, like, you know, some people were like, yeah, whatever. And then some people was, were like, oh my God, right? Like you see everyone's like reaction or pattern to it. And so what I get to sit with is, okay, there's always going to be unknowns. Like we don't know what's, we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But we really, we don't know what's going to happen at the end of the day today, but yet how do we feel safe and be like, oh yeah, like we don't, we just don't think about it. Right. It's like, oh, okay. Like how can we be with the unknown in such a way that uh, there, there is no worry, right. Or the worry or the, you know, any, anything like that is not prevalent. doesn't take over. So it's, and it's also like trusting in whatever you believe, right. That there's a power higher than us or God source, Buddha, Jesus, you know, divine, whatever anyone believes in. It's like giving space for also life to life. You know, I I was, I go outside and I, I do these like sacred surrenders where sometimes I'll just look at the sky and look at the clouds or look at nature and the trees. And, you know, it's just like, wow, like the clouds are moving without me even doing anything. Right. So there's this okay, that life is lifing. And how can we, how can we balance? And I don't like the word balance, but like be in the doing, right. But also be in the being of like allowing things to happen, but then co-creating and creating in the same moment. So that's the work that I'm actually in right now of, of being like, okay, surrendered, but also being like the co-creator of my life in a sense. Um, Super deep, I know, and super powerful. And it's just the awareness. Yeah, and I totally like that, that it is possible on the one hand, like, yeah, surrendering to that there is a kind of a higher purpose and that there is a leading by a higher source, whatever you call that. And on the other hand, being still active and creating and having a vision and really knowing what, like having more of this vision, it's not really the knowing where you want to go, what you want to create in your life and not becoming a victim, like saying, okay, whatever happens to me will happen. But having this kind of balance uh, of, of surrendering and creation, um, this is really amazing. And I think especially in these times that are super uncertain from my perspective, because you never know what will happen next month or even tomorrow. And not, I, I see a lot of friends who had, uh, and also my clients, who had this idea that they have kind of a stable and safe life by knowing that uh, they what they will do uh, in their job until they get to their retirement and like everything was really like planned and kind of the idea of being controlled and then when uh, two years ago covid hit everything was was kind of in chaos and, yeah. and from my point of view it still is yeah we are yeah. breaking old systems and new are created so it's a, a time of massive transformation and yeah also yeah, still being aware of that we are part of this creation as we are in connection to the higher source. Absolutely. Yeah, and how how can we, right, like sit, so when everything is chaos, right, when we talk about that external world or what we thought was safe then comes crumbling down, right, and that happens with like death, right, if, if anyone has experienced a, a death that was un, you know, it was just very shocking or or anything, really, really that took you out of that like safety or, or rocked your world it's like okay can we allow 
the grief to come up or allow like the, the state, the unsafeness to come up. But then it's like, how do we regulate ourselves? Right. How kind of like when a child has a, a tantrum and they're crying and they, they're like, they're very expressive. They're very expressive. And then you just allow, you just allow it to all come out. Right. The child just allows it. There's no suppressing. There's no, they, they just, they just have the tantrum. And then they, what happens, right. Is it's usually like 90 seconds. It could be longer, but they, they self-regulate themselves right? They like have that whimper, right? Like after they're like crying, right? So it's, it's, it's that conversation of like when we get rocked, right? And as adults, you know, we're not, you know, if you're in a meeting or, you know, I'm doing this podcast interview, you know, we can't just fly off the handle and be expressed in every moment. We, we could, um, but maybe not, right? So it's like having those dates. And I remember in corporate, when either I was, you know, humiliated in front of people or I was reprimanded, I mean, I have some stories in corporate, but it was like at that moment, I would run into the bathroom or excuse myself and cry in the bathroom stall, right? That was the way like how I needed to regulate myself. And then sometimes I just couldn't and I I broke down when I got home, right? So it's that when we're talking about that and like the unsafety or or you think your job is stable and or a, a deal or a situation or a relationship, whatever, right? And it's not, and then you're like, oh my gosh, you know, it blows up in front of your face. It's like, okay, how can we be with the grief, the shock, all of the emotions? And then also how do we self-regulate so we don't, you know, that, that we are seeking safety within ourselves. So we take care of ourselves. So we're not, you know, going crazy or we're not, right? So it's, it's that of feeling the feelings totally being expressed and then seeking like safety, right? And, and that could be anything from like, hand on heart, hand on stomach, just to be like, okay, my body, I'm safe here. It could be, you know, going out in nature, like anything that like makes you safe, makes you feel safe to regain that in in those moments. Cause it's really critical for us to get grounded in whatever practice that is, you know, it could be a cold drink of water. I mean, this is, we're getting into like the somatics, right? The the, the very uh, small things that people don't think are you know, eating fresh fruit, fruit, you know, cold fruit. So going for a walk. So it's, it's those little things that, okay, what can I do when I'm not feeling safe? And that could be, you know, a a safety toolkit kind of thing so that you feel like grounded in those moments where chaos or your external circumstances really are not going as planned. Yeah, and you speak about uh, emotions that can't be expressed in a certain moment, for example. No, and what I sometimes see is that uh, children are taught uh, not to express themselves, like be quiet, even though this is, kid feels like really expressing itself. And I think this also becomes like a behavior that we learn during our childhood that we can't show our emotions. We can't show when we feel unsafe or when we feel uh, angry these are kind of bad emotions so to say yeah we can be free and love this is okay but uh, as soon as we become uh, angry or um, sometimes even frightened uh, this uh, the parents often suppress this kind of expression of the feelings and then these guts get stuck in in our body and you said no after a while you will have uh, somatic problems and uh, your body will show that something is not going on right so um, if you if someone for example is grown up like that how can they start uh, getting access to these emotions uh, also like uh, where these emotions or are stored in their body and how can they start learning to express them and, and to, to balance uh, these emotions. Do you have any yeah. idea about that? A great question. So I was suppressed for years. So I, I could answer this question. Uh, and, and I was suppressed at my emotions because I was very shy. Uh, I, I wasn't expressive at all. And what had happened was um, I developed chronic illnesses, right? I have psoriasis, I have psoriatic arthritis, uh, I have a thyroid condition, like it, it literally manifests in your body. So, and if it doesn't now, it may over time, right? And it's not, that's not to, to scare anyone. However, you could start at any moment, right? So you, the first step I would say is for people because they don't, like they get angry, right? And this is why you see, say in a traffic jam, right? People, like someone will cut someone off and then depending on the type of day someone's having, 
some people would be like, oh, okay, that's, you know, it's okay. You know, and then other people would get out of their car, scream, and like, they'll go crazy. Right? Yeah, they'll like, and, and, and even other situations, right? Even in someone cuts you off in, in the store online, like you see people really like, cause it's, it's like these suppressed emotions then come out in a disassociated place. Right. So it could be trial, childhood trauma, right. That, you know, something occurred and, and the person's taking it out on the person that cut, cut them off in line, right. Or in traffic. So, and this is why the work, right. It, it is uncomfortable. Right. It, and I'm not going to lie. It's, it's feeling the emotions and letting it out. So if you need to cry, cry. And of course, like we just said, like if you're in a meeting, you can't just like ball and cry. I mean, but it's, it's getting used to feeling the emotions. Like it's okay. I remember one time I was going through a breakup. I think I cried every day for two months straight. Like, and I allowed that. I didn't shame myself. I didn't make myself wrong. And I think this is the key here is like not making yourself wrong in feeling the feelings, right? Like feel the feelings. And so you see a lot of people getting on, you know, depressive uh, and, and anxiety medications. And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not pro or con that. However, what I am asking people to do is feel your emotions first, right? Like let them out um, and start being with the emotions, not judging them, not being like, oh my gosh, I'm crying again or I'm anger again and expressing, you know, yourself with, with those emotions. So if you're, you're angry, go hit some pillows for two minutes or five minutes or, you know, get a wiffle ball bat or something and beat the pillows or beat your couch or whatever. Uh, so I think it's really allowing ourselves to feel it in our body and get reconnected in our body and some people were you know some of my clients are like oh I'll just take a boxing class and I'm like yes and no right because you also want to do it in a private place like if you're going nuts in the box I mean that's that's okay uh but really a place where you feel a hundred percent safe that you can go nuts right or cry or not because you also don't want other you don't, you don't want to be with the the thoughts of oh or other people judging me or any of that um, so sometimes like I'll go in my car and I'll scream in my pillows, right. Or I'll, you know, uh, whatever it is, like find a place where you feel completely safe to express yourself. Um, so I would say with that, the emotions and just being with it. I remember there was one point in my life I was working with a coach and every session I'm like, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. And every session I will cry. And it's okay because guess what? It was like years of all this suppression coming up that wants to be, be felt and seen and, and heard and loved, right? So if you look at your emotions as, you know, they're just, you know, it's just, it has to, like, I don't want to say toxicity, but it has to come out, right, in some way. So allowing yourself, if, even if you want to get angry once a week or you want to cry once a week or what, what have you, I think it's really important not to shame or, or judge ourselves and to allow space and grace for those things to be present. Uh, because if we suppress it, it's kind of like a beach ball, right? If you try to push a beach ball underneath the water, right? You, you can, you can keep, you know, pushing the beach ball for your entire life, but it's just going to keep popping up. Right? So, so if there's um, an issue or, or something, or even a partnership or a breakup or divorce or what have you, or, or, death of a family member or a child or anything, right? It's like, if we keep pushing it down, it's, it's inherently going to keep rising up and whatever it is, like, like you said, if the lesson isn't learned, it's going to keep repeating itself in different areas of your life. And again, not to scare you, but it's just to be aware of like, okay, let me handle this to the best of my ability um, and not suppress, you know, as, as much as I can allow myself and, and baby steps too. Right. Because some people new to this work, it's like, oh, my gosh, like it, it could be overwhelming. So it's just it's just taking like taking care of yourself, like baby steps. Um, so, yeah, I, that's what I would say on the suppressed emotions, just because, you know, for me, it definitely manifested in my body. Right. And um, and that it could manifest in your body, it could manifest in thoughts. Right. Uh, or different ailments. So I think it's critical just to be aware of it and, and to seek help as well. And um, to allow yourself and not judge yourself, like it, nothing's wrong here, right? And, and giving yourself forgiveness. And I think a lot of people, right, we say we forgive. Um, and do we really like forgive ourselves, forgive the other person? And that's a whole nother process. Hmm. And I see also that you, you said like pressing the ball on the water, it takes so much energy for suppressing it that you don't have the energy for creation for example so um 
I think one idea is, of course, you know, find uh, a place where you can express the emotions, but also you know, if uh, someone uh, would like to, to come to you, you, know, you, you can hold the space for someone uh, and help them through this process and uh, experience these emotions in a safe safe place, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's just critical, even in just breaking, like you said, the generational patterns, like you had said, right? It's, it's, I think it's absolutely critical. Yeah, so let me know a little bit, what are special topics um, people come to you with? Like, is this business or relationships or what are uh, topics uh, people ask you to, to work on? Yeah, so... <laughs> It, it's like it's like everything. I mean, they usually come to me for business, uh, but you and I both know, right? It's really never about the business, uh, and it's really never. I don't say never. Usually, the issue is not really the issue. There's always like the underlying things that contribute to the issue. So, typically, people come to me for business. You know, how to grow their business, how to find balance, how to scale, how to, like all those things, and. What I find is it's never, um, it, it could be in the relationship, right? It could be intimacy issues. It could be self-love issues. It could be not expressing themselves, right? Um, a lot of a confidence and imposter syndrome. So it's really the, the issues underneath the issue. Um, so if your business isn't growing to a certain point, we look at that, like why, right? Is it, is it? something is in the way. So I have coached thousands of people <laughs> on all different types of things. Um, and I would just say it comes down to, it's the inner work, you know, like I'm very good at strategy. Um, I can do business strategy all day long and you can have all the strategy. You can have all the bells and whistles. You can have all the systems. You can have all even like the partnerships, the collaborations, you could be, you know, in the media visibility. And if, if you're, if it's like, if you're not, if you're not dealing with the inner stuff, um, it's, you're only going to get so far, right? Because the under, uh, it's kind of like weeds. <laughs> you can have a great garden, but the weeds are going to pop up. So if you're not tending to the weeds, the weeds can actually take over, right? And you know, not have your garden like in a great shape. Um, and you can have all the, all the right things in the garden, plant the garden in a certain way. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not specific in gardens, but like you can do all the things, right? But then if you're not tending to these weeds, they can take over, right? So that's what I like to think of my work as, like we can do all the business stuff and it's more like of the what's getting in the way. Right. Because and sometimes it's just a simple strategy or technique or getting more visible or whatnot. And sometimes it's even even deeper. So I love to take clients like a little bit deeper than the surface, because it's usually something a deeper, um, a deeper thing that's going on. You know, because, again, at two years old, when you were two years old, you were unstoppable. Like, you, you know, you didn't have any of these like limiting beliefs, or the programming, like all of this stuff. And all it is, all this is, is a remembrance of who you are, what you're capable of. Um, and of course, like clearing some of the generational stuff, but it's like, you are just pure, like you didn't, it was just, you were just you, you know? And so the essence of that, and, and it's okay because we're going to face all of these things as we grow up, that, that's life. So it's, it's really like the unlearning and then relearning and then the reprogramming um, that I love to work with clients on. So and that can come in, but it's usually typically business that people come to me with. Hmm. And how can you figure out what is, for example, stopping me if I tell you, okay, I have everything created. I have joint ventures. I have my business set up, whatever it is. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if I would still tell you, okay, um, there is some blockage. How can you figure out? So what, how, what is the technique or how are you starting this process? Yeah. So I don't like, I don't have a specific like framework. I mean, in some of my courses I do, but when, if someone's coming to me, I get curious around where they feel they're stuck or they're blocked. Right. And we talk about that. And then I'm, I'm really just, at, I just get curious. I just ask a ton of questions of, you know, a little bit of childhood, you know, all, all these different types of questions, which 
and you and I both know, right? Like as healers, as coaches, other like there's a certain clairvoyance, there's a certain intu- intuition, there's a certain and you know, been coaching people for so long, it's like, uh, and not everyone's problem is the same, but there's certain themes that that reoccur for people. So I really just I'm very open, you know, when someone comes to me and says, okay, this is what I have, this is where I feel like I'm getting stuck. I don't box them in a framework per se. I really get curious of like, okay, where do they think they're stuck? And then I just get really curious about where, where that is. And then from there, then I'll, I'll be like, okay, either we'll do, we'll work on like the inner child work, or I'll do some IFS or, you know, somatic stuff, but it's very um, holistic because I don't know. And first of all, I don't know if I can help any, everyone either. Right. So that's why I also have referral partners like, like you and like different other experts that, because I'm not going to take someone on that's integrity. Like, and it's my name, it's my brand, it's my company. And it's like, also like being of service to the person, you know? So it's, it's really getting curious to see if, a, if I can even help you, if I can't, then I refer out. Uh, because I think that's also like in the coaching industry, um, we get to be very careful in the, in the healing industry, right? Because we may think we can help everyone, but only like if, if you know, and I feel for, for me, it's an intuitional guide, you know, it's like, can I help this person? Um, and really getting clear about that. Cause I think that's what I see. Some people just like taking everyone on um, and maybe they're not of, of service, right. To that person. So for me, it's, it's definitely more of an open curiosity at first um, you know, like I have a program called Chatter Your Own Glass Ceilings. That is for women entrepreneurs, you know, that are building their business and scaling and want to do the inner work and the outer work. So there's a little bit of framework. But again, I look at the collective and I'm not going to teach or coach around something that they're not going to need. Right. So um, for me, the process is really just, OK, with the person in front of me or the group in front of me, wh- where are you at? Getting curious. What do you need? And then, you know, really going with the different tools I have in my toolbox. And sometimes it does look like a framework depending on what it is. Um, and then going from there. So there's not really like a cookie cutter approach, but I would say that's my cookie cutter is like being with the person and seeing, you know, cause I've had people, I've clients come to me that again, w- worked on the business, but then, you know, it comes up within the coaching or the conversation that, Oh, well, my daughter is 16. Just try to commit suicide. Right. Oh, okay. So, but you came to me for business, right? So things like that, people, um, will, it will come out and you're like, okay. Right. Or, you know, I haven't been intimate with my husband for six months and we've been married for 30 years and have, you know, four kids. Right. So it's like, okay, what's going on there. So that comes up, right. So things can come up that, um, and that's why I say that the problem sometimes is not really the problem. Right. So I know that's a long ended answer to the question, but it's really for me getting accurate and curious about the person, if I can help them and if I can't, um, but it's typically usually business in the forefront of mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So, but what I see is like this openness and curiosity, exploring, analyzing uh, this person and then uncovering what is really uh, kind of below the surface in the, perhaps in the subconscious mind or uh, even on soul level and bringing this up and, yeah, on the sur- to the surface, and then of course, now you have your toolbox. Like, what what is it? What I need, and then um, working from there, reframing, uh, like uh, clearing, healing, uh, using this kind of techniques, and then bringing them into the direction they need to go. So this is really this this is a process, so to say. Yeah, yeah it's a it's process. Very open. Yeah, and it, it's a process, and also I do very a lot of business stuff too, right? So it's it's clearing that, but then getting like strategic, right? Like they're like you're so good at marketing, right? So it's like yes, I can do all of that, um, and I would say like I definitely don't do what you do, like the soul, yes, the soul level, but you know I'm only helping generational trauma and like clearing to only a certain point. Like I'm not a Reiki healer. I'm not, I'm not like any of those modalities. I'm not right. So it's, I can work with the person on their trauma because I'm trauma informed um, and the different somatics and stuff, but there also is a deeper layer to that too, right. With like what you do and your healing. So it's to me, my belief is like coaching is great as well as the healing. Like you get the healing, you get the coaching, you get like any modality. Cause it's going to, it's gonna, like the, uh, the 
the peeling back of the layers of the onion, right? It's like, um, and listen, sometimes I have three coaches at a time, you know, like, <laughs> so it's, it's like really, and, and a healer, right? So it's, it's, um, and I'm not saying everyone needs that either, but it's, it's getting accurate and honest of what the person needs too. Um, so yeah, I guess it is a process, uh, but at the end of the day, people need help and it's just like guiding them to, you know, whatever that next step is. Mm. If people are now curious, how can they come in contact with you or find you somewhere? Yeah, they can just, you know, just go to my website. It's kellylynnadams.com and all my social links are there and, and all the information is there. So that's the best place to, to find me. Yeah, thank you so much. Is there anything that I didn't ask you and you would like to share? Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I think all the questions were amazing and just for me to be expressed. And I, I really, I'm honored to be on this podcast. And I would just say for the people listening, you know, I always say this and I really believe it's true. If there's something like on your heart or in your head and there's like a pull uh, and whatever that is, it could be reinvention, it could be passion, it could be anything. Just listen to it, listen to it and take aligned action because Life is short. Uh, we're not promised, you know, any time here. And, you know, the late of uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, I think he said, like, don't die with your music still in you, right? So it's the same concept of, and even if you don't know, you don't need to know the how, right? Even if you don't know what, what it needs to look like, like, just one step aligned action forward. And so that's what I would leave people with. Wow. Amazing words. Thank you so much for being my guest today on this show. And uh, yeah, hope to speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening or watching my podcast, Holistic Creators. If you want to know more about how I can help and support you, have a look at my website, spiritualchangemaker.com. You can also join my Facebook group, Spiritual Changemakers Community. Stay tuned for the next episode by subscribing to this channel and you also can check the previous episodes.